Hey everybody, it's Dean here and I'm with Christian Harris. I'm going to let him introduce himself because he'll do it better than me. Uh, <laughs> Christian, do you want to say hello to everybody and tell them a little bit about what you do? Hi everybody. Yes, Dean, I do know myself slightly better than you know me, so uh, probably I'm best placed to do an introduction. <laughs> um, uh, where to start? I'm a husband and a father. I live in London and I've got a business called Slip Safety Services. So we're a floor safety and cleaning business and we help people to prevent slipping accidents, which are the biggest cause of accident and insurance claim in the UK. OK, and I'm just going to really push it and see if you can tolerate this. Sure. How did you fall into that, Christian? You know, whenever anyone asks me about how did I get involved in this, I always use that same pun myself. So you've beaten me to it. So now I've got nothing to say because you've, you've, uh, you've <laughs> taken away my you've taken away my story. No, the, the background really was that I was in, I've always been kind of entrepreneurial. So when I was at uni, I was doing some stuff in online poker and events and various other things. And then I uh, decided to go into the management consultancy world for a few years and then kind of got a bit bored of spreadsheets and uh, the monotonous grind of, of doing that. And so decided I would kind of try and get my hands dirty in a, a real business. <laughs> Came across this uh, opportunity, I suppose, because I saw there was a, uh, a really big problem, but it, the um, the solutions weren't there and the, the problem was kind of, it was an unmet need. And so uh, kind of dived into this and I've been doing it for kind of coming up for 10 years. Wow. Okay. So, so um, what do you, what was the challenges you faced in starting this business though? Because I mean, it's not an easy feat to start a business and no. it feels like you're flogging a dead horse for a long time and then suddenly it just feels like oh this is actually go it's starting, going somewhere. starting to work now yeah starting to work I think the big challenge I suppose uh, setting up a business is um, firstly the funding piece uh, so I got some investors to to support me uh, including my old boss funny enough from the <laughs> consultancy days which was which was good so and a nice uh, sign of, of trust uh, and then I think uh, and, and it's all about really um, trying to figure out the best ways of like delegating stuff, because I, I found certainly to start with, you know, everything was kind of heaped on me uh, and therefore things weren't being done um, to the best of my ability because I was just under too much pressure, I suppose. And, and also I was doing kind of the more functional stuff, which mm. is not really my forte. You know, I'm more about the kind of client facing sales and marketing side of things that's where I can add the most value so I think the challenges for me were in terms of actually physically getting the business going were around yeah the the cash flow piece which I think every business uh, is <laughs> is obviously uh, contending with and then yeah just how to uh, organize and uh, organize things and build the team to enable us to perform you know kind of how we want to perform mm. so um this whole uh, you know slips trips and everything um, you might hate me after I say this, but um, it does have this connotation, doesn't it, of where there's blame, there's a claim and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Most businesses, you know, don't think that's about them. Um, where, are the th where are the places that you're seeing, you know, the average business, this is probably, you know, it happens, but it's probably a bit more normal, you know, you pick yourself up and you, you know, get on with it. Yeah, but yeah. I guess there's a lot of public spaces where this kind of, you know, slips and trips and things mm -hmm. can become a major expenditure and a major cost, uh, not only from a point of view of, you know, people having accidents, but also people can exploit that as well, can't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you a few stats in terms of trying to frame the kind of, uh, the, the piece overall. So every year, over 300,000 people go to hospital as a result of slipping over. And that leads to over one and a half million NHS bed days. So if you think that the average cost of an NHS bed day is over 500 quid straight away, you're wow. talking in the hundreds of millions of pounds of cost to society. Then you've obviously got the personal injury claims, which arise, the average cost of that is about 10k. Uh, but it's not just the uh, insurance cost it's also all the other hidden costs like investigating the accident and uh, loss of reputation and so on and so forth so the uh, the kind of rule of thumb is that the if the insured cost is 10k the true cost of the accident is something like 125 135k 
uh, multiply that by 300,000. You've got some quite punchy numbers there. Um, so, so, so an organization that's got, you know, I don't know, um, a swimming pool. How would that work in a swimming pool? Because I've seen on LinkedIn, you do post some, you know, I'm a bit naive when I look at your pictures because I'm yeah. not in your industry, but it looks like that flooring you have in swimming pools, that could be like crippling to a, to a, a business like that, couldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that people don't really yet understand the subject in as much depth as they need to. And that's kind of a lot of what I'm doing on LinkedIn is this educational piece, just trying to get people to understand what they should be looking for, and what they should be doing. But yeah, I mean, any, any, uh, obviously, all these businesses have insurance. But insurance only covers you up to a certain amount, uh, because you've got uh, your excess. So you know, the first 10 20 50k is going to come out of your bottom line so yeah one issue with one uh, swimming pool could be you know financially quite crippling to to any company um so we uh, you said about the ambulance chasing thing and that's really where we're trying to avoid uh being in that position we want to try and encourage people to be proactive about this so raising awareness uh, getting them to act in cooperation with their insurers uh, and brokers and people like that and actually try to get ahead of the game and um, prevent things from happening, you know, rather than uh, looking to, to sort of rush in after a, a claim's happened and uh, and be reactive. So um, tell me if I'm taking this down a, ra- a, a rabbit warren you don't want to go, but I'll have a go anyway. That's all right. So um, there's obviously people who have genuine accidents and all that kind of stuff and slips and trips, but we all know that even though there's legislation to say you can't do this and there's people who look for blame even in common sense scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you the ambulance chasers? And I'm not meaning the genuine people who help no. people who've hurt themselves because of irresponsibility and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, somebody who isn't watching what they're doing, they're being a bit stupid and slips and has an accident and then goes, ah, you know, a yeah. bit like a football match when one of those footballers falls over. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Are you the ambulance chasers' worst nightmare? Um, I suppose we could be because the, the theory of what we try to do or the state we try to get our clients in is that they can document and prove that they're taking kind of beyond reasonable steps to uh, avoid any accidents. So legally, if you can show that you've you know, thought through the floor choice, thought through the maintenance, following out the procedures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, people do know that accidents will happen. And therefore, if you can show you've taken all these steps, you should be in a very good position to be able to defend claims um, either so that you don't pay any costs or you're paying the absolute bare minimum. So, mm. yeah, we kind of are really. We're trying to help people, the corporates of the world and the, um, you know, the businesses, the organisations of the world to be in a better position to defend claims and stop these kind of spurious things, which mm. do happen. I mean, there are businesses where in the retail world where, you know, it's kind of known in the industry that if you if you stick a sort of letter in and, and ask them for a few hundred quid, uh, they'll just send you a voucher or whatever because they don't want that to kind of escalate and get out of control. Um, so, you know, it, it is could, something that doesn't send happen. send me a list of those people who give vouchers. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly say. Certainly not in a, certainly not in a public forum. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, lots of, of, of clients, um, well, not, not clients, but lots of corporates still are in a position where they haven't really taken the trouble to understand this well enough and therefore they're they're getting stung by um both these kind of totally spurious claims uh, but also people that are kind of that have have had an accident yeah. but they end up mm-hmm. trying it on a bit yeah. and you know so rather than being off work for two weeks they're off work for three months you know and it's kind of uh, but if, if, if you haven't got the um evidence to be able to prove that you've done everything that you reasonably could to prevent the accident then you're in a quite bad position when it comes to trying mm-hmm. to defend a claim so just thinking about corporates and big businesses and, 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 you know, you've ventured into this world, you've got your investors on board, but you're relatively, you know, you're doing a, a lot of work with big businesses, but you're, you're a relatively small footprint of a business. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you, how do you find the prospect and process of, of, of engaging for new business with larger organizations? Is it easier, harder? Well, I think that uh, it's it's it can be harder in that you know they have maybe layer upon layer of decision making. I think there's there's pros and cons to all of these things. 
Um, we try where we can to kind of partner up with, um, a, you know, some sort of stakeholder that has a relationship already with mm. the, the target prospect customer. So the insurance companies uh, being a great example. If we can go in with their recommendation or or even with them, you know, together pitching something, um, then the the prospect is kind of more open to sharing information and more open minded to what we're doing. Um, if I meet somebody um, at a networking event or if I cold call somebody and I said, not when I'd say this, but I bet you have loads of slipping accidents, don't you? Uh, they, they, they put their barriers up straight away. Oh, no, we don't have a problem with that. Um, whereas if you're going in there in a, in a kind of constructive, consultative way, uh, then, you know, that that helps the conversation to, to go um, in the right direction. Mm. In terms of, um, you know, for me, it takes me pretty much as long to sell uh, a solution into a single um, hotel as it would to somebody with 100 hotels, give or take, because actually they still need to see the same evidence. Mm. Um, they're still making the same return on investment calculations. Um, they, they still have the same conversations with their insurers. So our sweet spot is probably, you know, companies that have sites ranging from maybe half a dozen up to 100. Uh, once you get over to over 100, it starts to be a bit more complicated because then it's kind of, um, you know, decision by committee, which is always... Uh, it was an interesting uh, thing, but um, yeah, we tend to do most of the stuff we do is 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 kind of p brands that people have heard of, I guess. Mm. So, do you think if somebody's watching this now and we haven't put them to sleep? Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, come you... on, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is me. I'm pretty boring when I get going. Oh no. Um, do you <laughs> think it's easier? Do you think? When somebody's starting a business and they go, oh, for an example, I can sell to these small businesses, and I'm not dissing small businesses in any way, shape, or form, but you just said there, it's it's sometimes it's the very similar sales process for, say, a, a, a small business as to a, let's say, a mid-sized business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the difference is that in my view, if you're if you've got the choice, and I don't mean this nasty to any small businesses, it's easier for a, a bit bigger of a business to appreciate the value of something. When a small business, for an example, in my old world, I used to I used to run an agency, yeah, marketing agency, and I knew that to get um, to get a small business to go on a project that was say five hundred pounds a month was quite a big decision mm -hmm. because that's the that's the price of their van or do you know what I mean? Whereas a bit bigger business to commit to like four or five thousand pounds a month was a much more straightforward. Yeah. What's the return on investment? What can we get for our money? If you were if you had the choice, mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm going to put you in a really tricky position here. If you had the choice, which would be the which would you go for that middle business or would you go for the smaller businesses? I, I yeah, I'd go for the kind of mid, the mid-sized businesses personally. Um, I think I think you're right that uh, it is easier to get um, 5k out of a bigger business than 500 out of a smaller business, albeit you know because it, it's all proportional, isn't it? Albeit I, I suppose yeah. once you get to once you get to bigger numbers. I mean, I was chatting with somebody the other day. Um, about uh, an investment that a mutual acquaintance had made that was you know 100 grand or something that had gone down the toilet and this guy um you know is a multi-millionaire i believe and, and so yes he can afford 100 grand but as i said to this other guy you know 100 grand still 100 grand uh, yeah. doesn't matter how much money you've got it's still 100 grand whereas 10 grand for that for that person yeah it probably is a bit of a drop in the ocean so i think you know it it, it does it does depend pretty big then obviously it is a different kind of conversation i mean i think that um medium-sized businesses are always going to be that little bit more sophisticated um mm -hmm. than than a, than a than a one-man band or a very small business and and so uh, particularly with the kind of niche that i'm in in terms of risk management of things they are going to be perhaps a bit more able to think about that in a more strategic kind of way um, but I'm sure that's the same with marketing or with any any kind of service as well. You know, I think the, the bigger you get, you've got a bit more space and headroom to, to kind of think things through and take a step back. And because I guess you're if you're the, the MD or the CEO or whatever you call it of that midsize business, you're hopefully working on the business, not in the business. Whereas when your head's down and you're working in the business and you're doing everything and, um, you know, you, you, 500 quid, um, you know, it. it 
it's a big amount of money and you can't really sit back and think, well, what's the benefit of this in the long term? But the effort to sell 500 quid and 5,000 quid is probably the same, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that's probably true, yeah. yeah. Certainly uh, in, in things that I've sold in the past, yeah, I would say that um, you know, it takes as much. I think five million quid is a different thing, but yeah, yeah. five grand and 500, yeah. It's a, it's a bit like the saying when you, when you borrow money from the bank. I don't know whether you've heard this. If you ever borrow money from the bank, if you owe the bank 10 grand, they, they own you. But if you owe the bank 10 million, you own them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, just coming to your business, because um, I want to ask you some questions, and you might think, "Oh, I don't know how to answer them." In which case, tell me not. Not. Were you af- were you afraid when you ventured out and started your own business? Were you worried? Um, I was a little bit worried. Um, not so much that it would totally tank, but just worried about. Uh, the the kind of pressure and stuff because um, I uh, I cope all right with pressure but in certain cases I think pressure you know I, I can I'm kind of prone to procrastinate a little bit but it's actually been really good for me doing this because I've started making uh, decisions I think much more quickly and better and, and starting to um, you know for example I, I would be one of these people that would be poring over a website for hours on end or a letter or whatever Whereas actually now it's kind of right. Don't let um, perfect be the enemy of good. Um, yeah. Good and done. Good and finished is better than um, perfect in draft. So I think that's been that's been helpful uh, mm. to sort of move move me on. And, and I think as a, as a kind of a business leader, I'm in a much better place now than I was. So I think that you know I, I wouldn't say um, I, I was scared of failure, um, but I think that there's always that kind of um, can I can I deliver it? Can I do it? You know, yeah. from a personal perspective, that makes it's, sense. It's interesting because the very reason people start businesses is to take their destiny into their own hands. And then that kind of niggle is actually my destiny's in my own hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's kind of a double edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, there's, I mean, look, there's nobody to then, to then blame if it goes wrong, is there? So yeah. you, um, you know, which, which some people will thrive upon and other people will, sort of shy away from yeah um if you want to run a business you've got to you've basically got to thrive on that otherwise you're never going to get anywhere so uh you've got there's 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 two types of customer there's the customers you really want to work with and the customers you don't want to work with and i'm not yeah. talking about size or anything like that how do you go about deciding who is a good and bad customer for your business so I think it's uh, we, we try and qualify people as much as we can because we're, we're trying to kind of keep our um, core sales team uh, to the to the absolute bare minimum and try and leverage digital assets and things like that to try to uh, to, to qualify um, leads, but also lead generation and stuff. Um, I think really it's a cultural thing. So <clears throat> some companies will have a culture of wanting to uh, invest into safety and best practices and standards because there's two sides to what we do it's about um safety on one hand and, and sort of brand standards aesthetics on the other um so some com- companies will be drawn to that and other companies won't be so i think within you know a conversation um you can probably pretty well figure out whether a company is likely to be um, a good target from in terms of a fit um you know i think every big company would say safety is our number one priority but in reality that doesn't often translate down uh, all the way through the organization to the shop floor so uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to figure it out but but broadly speaking you know we can get a pretty good idea within one conversation as to whether it's a go or not or it's worth investing um, time into i think you know that's really important for any business because particularly if you've got something that is a service-led proposition and it's a you know a relatively costly uh, thing it's not like you're selling a biro for 99p um, if the sales cycle is going to take some time, you need to be quite harsh with yourself to figure out fairly early on, you know, is this going to go anywhere or not? Because if it's not, why waste your time? There's plenty of other fish in the sea. Yeah, and it is sometimes if you're if you're dealing with a big high value sale, you don't want to let it go. But at some point you have to say they're a tire kicker, they're the wrong fit. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard saying no to a... To, to, or letting what looks like a juicy prospect go um but it's, it's like it's a bit like you know when i um 
took on some investment, you know, um, 48% of a company that's worth X is, is worth a lot more than 100% of a company that's worth nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you just have to be pragmatic, don't you? I'm, I'm a fairly pragmatic kind of guy, so I think you just have to roll the punches. Um, you know, as long as you're in the right kind of sectors and the right business that you know there is a, a nice, large, addressable market there for you, you can't win everything. So you just have to um, move on and, and try and have your time spent talking to the people that um, that are likely to pay you some money. <laughs> so um, if you were, this is a cheesy question, but I'm going to ask it. And then um, I'm going to ask you for your summary pitch of what your business does. Let's assume I'm your ideal client. You'd probably run a mile if I was your client, but never mind. <laughs> um, what, out of your business journey so far, what would you sell, tell a, a 20 year younger than, hang on, I can't even say that. What would you say to yourself if you were 20 years younger? Uh, stop shaving your head. Um, <laughs> I think I would... Um, did I you would... really shave your head? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you I were... did. Wow. I, I, did. I shaved my head, but not for uh, not because I want to, because otherwise I don't... it's weird, fuzzy. Yeah. I'm afraid I don't have any pictures with me, but there are... The pictures do, pictures do exist. Yeah, before before um it was this kind of thing with a few of us at school anyway um what would i what would i say to myself i think i would probably say that um just to 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 back yourself so i think there have been instances where i haven't maybe backed myself as i said earlier and procrastinated a bit um and and that's kind of uh held me back a little bit i think over the years so Mm. i think that's you know i think you have this kind of internal dialogue with yourself don't you and Mm pretty much your intuition is is spot on if you're thinking if something's nagging at you and you're thinking this is wrong or or i should be taking this other course then probably go go for that and and, and perhaps don't let life get in the way because you know, there's always an excuse well i'll do it next week or i'll do it next month or i'll do it next year or you know whatever but i think um backing your intuition really it would probably be what i would say okay and now this is the hard bit and then we'll wrap up uh Imagine your ideal client is watching this video now. God help them. Um, what would you say to them about what you can offer them? Well, I mean, my my I suppose my elevator pitch, if you want to call it that, I kind of started at the at the start of the uh, the interview. But um, basically, slips is the biggest cause of accident in in the UK in terms of public spaces uh, causing the most accidents. As I say causing the most insurance claims. The average claim costs about £10,000, but the true cost of one of these accidents is well over £100,000. Um, we partner with insurers, brokers, floor suppliers, FM companies and other stakeholders to kind of raise awareness of the seriousness of the issue, uh, but also some of the solutions that are available. And typically where we work with clients, they see a 50% uh, or greater reduction in their accidents, and therefore seeing fewer people getting hurt, uh, fewer costs, fewer claims, etc. So, you know, if you are a business that does have either a proven history of having these kinds of accidents or the potential for having them, uh, we can save you a lot of money. You are the man. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, just before I go, I want to ask you, is that your car in the background? No, it's not my car. It's uh, It's just a meeting room that I'm in. I've got a Figaro. I don't know if you know what a Figaro is. Figaro? Uh, it's it's one of these. Um, you'd know if you saw it. It's. Um, do you remember the Andrew Marr show? He used to drive around in the opening titles in one. It's like a little tiny Japanese imported car. I think it was like a Nissan Micra, but with a almost like a sports car chassis on it. And they imported them for about. They made them for about two years. And it's a bit of okay. like a collector's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna a collector's Google item. That. Yeah, Google it. Yeah. Uh, what will make you laugh is Google it and then imagine me, my wife and our two kids in the car and then you'll crack up because <laughs> it's not exactly a, it's not exactly a family car. Like that, that is something that is a mental picture. Everybody who watches this video needs to for two adults, two children in a yeah. Figaro, whatever and I'm, Figaro is. And I'm six foot three as well. So it's a bit like it's a bit like sort of my knees are here and I'm kind of. <laughs> OK. Well, uh, it must be interesting when you go if you go to any client meetings. No, I don't. I, I don't really use it for, for. I mean, I live in London, so pretty much everything yeah. I do is on the trains and and stuff. Um, 
but uh, or, or I, uh, if I need a vehicle, I turn up in something a little bit more appropriate. <laughs> okay. Well, Christian, this has been really, really interesting. Um, uh, we're connected on LinkedIn, but if 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 you uh, like cut of Christian's jib, and uh, you want to connect with him, uh, you are open to people connecting with you on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn is a great place because, uh, as you mentioned, I'm doing kind of content pretty much every day. Uh, so you can kind of get the the gist of what we're doing. And uh, I'm very active on there every day. So, yeah, it's a good good place to communicate. Awesome. Well, Christian, it, the sun is shining here. I don't know about in London. Yes, so it I, is. Yeah. I'm going to disappear and I'm going to enjoy a weekend at the beach. Good. Oh, well, I don't blame you. Have a, have a good time. One, one of the benefits of working around the country but living in Cornwall. Yeah, I mean, I have to say Cornwall's a beautiful place, so I'm a little bit jealous. But then London's great as well. Lots to do. Lots yeah, to I, see, love, so. I love the bustle and the the pace of London. I think it's yeah. it's an incredible vibe to be in. It's like It's like when you go to America and you go to like somewhere like New York and suddenly the scale of things change. Yeah. London's exactly the same. Yeah, and I, it's like it, it's different. Yeah, I think I'd probably, for the foreseeable future, struggle to kind of leave London now because I'm kind of used to having everything at my fingertips. Um, I grew up in the countryside, but um, I'm kind of a London boy now, I suppose. Cool. Right. Well, it's been a All pleasure right. having you, Christian. Uh, Thank you, Dean. Uh, follow Christian. Check out his content on his LinkedIn. But uh, Christian, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Dean. Cheers.